This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I've enjoyed our conversation so far. And this is really part of a series, and um, it started very unexpectedly with Salman Rushdie, who has been a, is a regular member of our community and has included other writers such as um, Umberto Eco and the evolutionary biologist um, Edward O. Wilson and uh, upcoming Jimmy Carter, so they kind of broadly define the world of arts and letters and science. Um, and especially interested in the creative spirit, what nurtures and develops creativity. And I'm told by a source close to you, um, who shall remain nameless, that um, at an early age, you or perhaps your mother was given the choice between um, music or French lessons, piano or French lessons, um, and my source says to calm you down. Um, <laughs> and you look very calm, actually. Well, this yeah, was, so it must have worked. <laughs> it was an ultimatum. Um, my mother taught me how to read uh, pre kindergarten, and uh, I was going to St. Athanasius in Evanston, Illinois, a uh, little parochial school. And so the nuns found out, actually, they, you know, they were on the one hand sort of proud that I could read, uh, although they had some ladies from the archdiocese show up to test my reading skills. And I think the day before, my sister and I had had a fight, and she'd actually scratched my cornea. So my reading was not at its best. But in any case, I was reading well enough so that the nuns felt that I was going to be bored and get into trouble. Hmm. I hadn't given them any cause to think that I was I actually going to make no, trouble. No, certainly not. But uh, they felt a that premonition. it was a premonition, and they, they felt that, that an ultimatum was in order, that I could uh, be given piano lessons or French lessons for $15 a week. And my mother, thinking that I had perfect pitch, which I don't, I could just read the record jacket that said this was Van Cliburn playing Tchaikovsky's piano concerto in B-flat minor, um, we went with piano lessons. Mm -hmm. And I remember my first piano lesson. Uh, I don't remember much from childhood except seeing middle C on the blackboard and finding that on the keyboard. And the whole system seemed to make a sort of intuitive sense. And so that, that we went on from there. And Did you ever learn French? St still working on it. No, the French is really completely ridiculously bad. Uh, I, can't, I can't even speak Quebecois for that matter. <laughs> Well, while we're on the subject of your childhood, I understand that you also were a member of a rock band, is that right? I eventually, um, when I, I was very serious about the piano, and I was the only kid on my block that did, that, uh, that, that played piano fairly well, and, uh, but girls were not very impressed with being able to play the Sixth Hungarian Rhapsody of Liszt, <laughs> and, um, my sister got me into... It must have been a crowd you were hanging out with. It was maybe. the bad crowd. It was a bad crowd. They were... Uh, my sister got me into the Beatles, and I was listening to Top 40 and, and uh, started listening a little bit more seriously. And then I thought, well, maybe if I had a rock band, I'd be more popular. And so I started my own little rock band in about sixth grade. It still didn't impress any girls at all. But in any case, that's how I sort of got into popular music. And, um, and were you playing the piano on the rock? I band? was playing, well, it's also embarrassing to say, but most uh, popular music involving uh, piano or keyboards at that time was not the best, not the most memorable. I mean, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer were my big heroes, and they were sort of faux rock classical, and so they were probably right in the, right in the pocket for me, but not stuff you really want to remember mm -hmm. too avidly or proudly. I saw The Doors play when I was very young. And they, had, they were basically a, a keyboard band. Santana had a good keyboard player. Iron Butterfly had a good keyboard player. But I don't know, rock and roll piano was not that impressive. Elton John was kind of... So did you play the I played I played the Farfisa electronic organ uh -huh. and piano when it was available. And uh, so this was all something that I kept very uh, close to the vest. It was not something that my piano teacher knew about. So I think this has probably stood me in good stead in, in light of our young charges on From the Top because uh, their musical tastes above and beyond their choice of study oftentimes lead them to other 
forms of music that their teacher may not approve of, mm -hmm. etc. Um, so yeah, I thought I thought it was a really good thing. I, I actually kept up with popular music to the point where I was uh, sort of veering from rock into jazz and jazz rock, and and then actually by the time I was auditioning for conservatories, I was actually playing jazz professionally in uh, Pittsburgh, where I finished high school. And part of my choice of school, New England Conservatory, had to do with the fact that they had, uh, under the guidance of President Gunther Schuller, uh, a, a rather, you know, uh, open uh, and, and respectful attitude toward a whole lot of music. Uh, so among other things, I, we were doing a lot of contemporary classical music. We were doing, I was playing in the New England Conservatory Ragtime Ensemble. Wow. Gunther was involved in uh, revitalizing interest in the music of Scott Joplin and uh, Jelly Roll Morton and, and lots of James Reese Europe, lots of uh, American uh, icons of the jazz era. And, and Gunther instilled in me the idea that taking any of these uh, styles uh, to heart really meant studying them and uh, reinvigorating them in, in a very knowledgeable and respectful manner so that any, any kind of music that you really love involves a, a great deal of study and dedication. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, playing ragtime is not a busman's holiday. It's really uh, uh, a style that needs to be studied and, and worked hard at. Do you find that these different styles of music inform one another in odd or interesting or unexpected ways? Very unexpected. Sometimes um, there are there are there are easy commonalities which may not translate uh, in exactly the way you would think. I remember the first time I heard uh, the tangos of the Argentine composer Astor Piazzolla. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine who was just coming back from a gig in the Sao Paulo Brazil Orchestra, and he brought back this little cassette recording of this insane tango music it sounded it sounded politically and emotionally charged it sounded like there there were you know people being disappeared and and uh, and uh, there was there was great anguish as well as great passion in this music and i grew to love the music instantaneously uh, but and it also had aspects of american jazz mm -hmm. to it and so that's another reason that i found it very compelling as at that time uh, somebody who was somewhat conversant in jazz but it was many years later that I came to have the opportunity of playing uh, two piano versions of Piazzolla tangos with the guy who I'd heard on that tape, wow. uh, not Astor Piazzolla himself, but his pianist, Pablo Ziegler. And it was funny because my idea of the music was informed as a jazz player, I mean, with some classical leanings. But in working with Pablo, I guess the American jazz ethos has a sort of a jabby, smart alecky kind of thing to it. And with Pablo, he said, you know, the music really begins from the ground up. It is essentially a dance form. Hmm. And so it's really not the syncopation or the smart alecky thing that's most important. It's the groundedness and, and the earthiness, the passion of, of it from that aspect that really has to be dealt with. And, and so it was, again, a, a very unexpected uh, sort, of, sort of way of coming into that music and something that I you know, needed to have explained to me firsthand by somebody who was a, a, a real, you know, the, the greatest living practitioner of the music. So the context of it, the meaning of it. Very important. Yeah, where it comes from. Well, your work, I'm actually going to read this. Your work has been described by the LA Times and others with such phrases as infectious passion, <laughs> tantalizing, uh, This I like this one, laced with otherworldly elegance, and E.T. <laughs> yeah, there's a nice thought. And oceanic momentum. Wow. Yeah, that's great, isn't okay. it? Okay. Uh, so my question is, how do you prepare yourself for your performances um, and also for creating the arrangements? Oh. If, if, because it, it obviously has some kind of impact that seems to be beyond just the, the kind of the, the momentary awareness or innovation, something, something beyond that, a, kind of an opening up by bringing two 
different kinds of musical genres together. Mm -hmm. A classical one with perhaps a rock or a jazz or other kinds of influence. Mostly I just play what I like. That's, that's really mm -hmm. it. I mean, there have been very informing moments when, let's say, with, with a group of musicians, we've been assigned a piece of music that somebody else, maybe who had played at that festival a year ago, had thought, well, this is a good combination of instruments, and it's the same combination as this other piece that we really liked, so let's do this. And then they were no longer there, and we were there sitting, sitting there thinking, well, why are we playing the... Uh, the Hindemith Quartet. It's a terrible, terrible piece. But there again, you know, there you have what's on the page and what is the composer's printed intent and trying to get that off of the page uh, as best you can and trying to glean as much information from the text as you can and you come up with a performance that's, you know, really quite, in the end, quite compelling, regardless of, of of whether you feel an empathy with the music. Now, it's a very far cry from that to working on something that, that you love, although I've had object lessons there as well. You know, a friend of mine playing the Schumann Fantasy said, you know, this is my favorite piece of music that I can name. And I, I, I didn't really quite think it was such a compelling performance because there again, you're internalizing the music, you're, you're connecting so personally with the music that you don't even right. bother to get it across the footlights. Mm -hmm. Or at least that was my impression. It's so more I'm, about your own immediate yeah, experience. Yeah, and, and, and <clears throat> so I think the suspension of disbelief is probably the most important aspect of, of any kind of performance. Uh, you know, the tale of the ancient mariner, you know, a good case in point, you know, just some, you know, just the rest of the world, you know, completely evaporates and it's all in the telling of this tale mm -hmm. that, uh, that's, that's something that really should happen or, and can happen in musical performance, and, and that's kind of the whole idea of, of, of what a great performance is. And what I find great about music oftentimes leads me to certain general characteristics of, of music that are inherent and present in all kinds of genres of music. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a, a, a juicy sort of harmonic language, sort of, sort of a chord or a, or a you know a, a, a turn of phrase that that really gets under your skin, um, and I find that in you know most great music, that's a universal reaction, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a, a, a rock song you know by Radiohead or whether it's a piece of music by Ravel or Shostakovich. I also find. Uh, utterly compelling, uh, the idea of interweaving of textures, uh, so so less an idea of a, of a vertically oriented piece of music like you know some of the more simplistic pop music is 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 rather more an onslaught than an argument. <clears throat> I find that the music that I find compelling in any genre is that which has a particular idiosyncratic personal weave to it, an, inter, an interlocking and interplay of voices. So can you give an example of that? Well, so for instance, you know, the, the, uh, in, in the classical world, that would be, you know, some of the most complex pieces are, are some of the most simply expressed. Uh, a Bach or a Shostakovich fugue, for instance, which, which opens with, you know, one voice as it were, giving you sort of the lexicon of, of what is going to be the rhetoric, the argument of that piece of music, and then uh, imitatively and rhetorically, uh, another voice joins it, and using the same rhetoric, the same language, the same argument, the same motive, uh, two voices, three voices, four voices. That, to me, makes, makes, for, a, makes for a really interesting time at the piano. Uh, the fact that a, that a musical texture is is the culmination of of different voices, not necessarily four voices doing the same thing, and that uh, also is is the case in in music of Radiohead. Not that they're a, a particularly arty ensemble, but because all of their songs tend to be a culmination again of ideas that each one of the five member ensemble contribute to every song. 
Um, it's, it's very rare that you have a Radiohead song that sounds like it was written by one uh, composer. I mean, the, the, the lead singer, Tom York, oftentimes does a lot of the songwriting, but most of the, I mean, and I only know this because I've, I've done arrangements and therefore I have to give uh, composer attributions to each one of these arrangements, and I find that, no, all five of them have composer credits, and this is because one way or another, each one of them is contributing one voice, one motive, one idea to the weave that becomes that particular song. So when you interpret their work and you arrange that work, does that make you also a collaborator in the, in the creation of their work or a creation of your own work? That's What, what, is, what becomes your relationship with the, with the, uh, the, the original artist and also with the, with the piece itself, with the work itself? I think it's very much still in the same vein as, as what I do as an interpreter uh, of a Beethoven sonata mm -hmm. or a Stravinsky piece. I mean, Stravinsky is a, is a good example of a composer who wrote one thing one way, and then because we have recording technology available to us, um, he conducted it one way, let's say in the 1920s, revised it yet again in the 30s and 40s, changed the orchestration, changed the tempos. Um, we have, uh, with Chopin, for instance, we have not only the first printed edition, but then we have other editions or other manuscripts that uh, were used when he was teaching these pieces to various students of his. And so dynamic changes, uh, loud, soft, tempo changes uh, took place. Maybe he was reacting to the personality of that particular performer and maybe there was enough leeway available to him as a creative artist so that it was okay to be playing it a different way. Again, this is it's a, it's a matter of, of differentiating the ideas between composers. Stravinsky, for instance, even, even though his own interpretations of his pieces varied somewhat, uh, he, he was still such a control freak that <coughs> His piece, Le Nos, The Wedding, which was written for four pianos, uh, chorus, and vocal soloists. Uh, his ideal conce conception of that piece was apparently for four player pianos, because he didn't trust four pianos, to, four pianists to play together right. in rhythm. So, you know, take it out of their hands entirely. Let's, get, let's dehumanize the process. Well, um, I, I, think, I think that they're, you know, my, my dealing with dead composers has led me to believe that there is enough greatness inherent in a piece of music that can withstand different points of view to that, to that music. So, in like fashion, with Radiohead, uh, there are different versions available. There are different uh, performances. There, there's uh, the recorded performance that we hear in the studio, and then uh, the, the nerd and geek that I am, there are different performances in the hundreds of concerts that they've given uh, of this particular song and this particular performance has changed over time. Uh, there, so there are some, of, some arrangements that I've done of their songs that, that, uh, Hugh, uh, that, that s stay strictly to the first performance that I heard of that piece. There are others that take into account other performances and take aspects of each of those performances <coughs> and make an amalgam that I feel works best on piano. Uh, the music of Elliot Smith, for instance, is another example. You know, he was a, a multi-instrumentalist and so was able to make choices in the studio that involved a plethora of, of, of different instrumentations and yet he made different choices as a solo artist when he was playing and singing on the guitar or piano and just by himself. So those choices may inform the way that I make an arrangement on piano. Um, and, it, and then on top of that, you know, the fact that I'm dealing with a piano and I'm not singing, thank goodness, <laughs> that I don't have uh, the advantage of, of being able to project in any kind of coherent way the lyrics right. of, of the songs. And so I'm trying to get if I can't do actual, you know, word painting per se, I can at least get the sense of the lyrics across 
the color of the lyrics across, the sense of musical irony uh, across in a different pianistic sort of way. Um, but basically, you know, it, it, it all comes down to the song itself. It really is a matter of coveting a piece of music, saying that, well, the piano, the conceit of the piano is, is that it is, and always has been for me, this wonderful, amazing box that all kinds of colors can come out of. I mean, and so you can, you can emulate a symphony orchestra, or you can emulate a, a concert pipe organ, or you can emulate a five-piece rock band. Um, and that, uh, that this, this is all possible within the piano. Um, some artists that you're thinking about working with their works now, you've worked, you know, you mentioned Radiohead, mm -hmm. I also saw Tori Amos and Nirvana, Pink Floyd. Um, you have some friends at Athens who are musicians yeah. as well. So I just wonder if you have anything kind of bubbling to the surface there and, oh, how, and how that grabs you, how, that, how the music grabs you and then how it transforms. It's always the song. Uh -huh. It's never, I mean, you know, I have my favorite bands, I have my favorite ensembles over the years, but when I decide to make a song arrangement, it's always because there's a particular song that I just can't get out of my head. And so, for instance, the latest record that I've made, it's called Out of My Hands, uh, involves arrangements of the work of a lot of different ensembles. And these are, these are bands that I've been working on all the time that I've been doing Radiohead. I've been doing Nick Drake and Elliot Smith and Tori Amos and Tears for Fears and R.E.M. and Nirvana and Pink Floyd. And, and so the, the latest record is just a, an outcome of, of that obsession with the song you know, of the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, 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 if that's the case, then I think there are probably two or three other albums of material that, are, that have been bubbling up uh, over the last few years, because there's always a song that you know that I'm, I'm just you know obsessed with at the moment. Mm -hmm. At present, you know it, it, it can it can go all kinds of different directions. You know I've I've also come to realize that uh, having having the forum of public radio, I, I have a great opportunity to uh, do some service to contemporary classical composers. I mean it's so it's not necessarily always about arrangements of things that I'm just passionate about. It's about giving a, a mouthpiece to some composers that, you know, I think are deserving of, mm -hmm. of that kind of um, exposure. Right. And so there, there's a whole set of new pieces by Kenneth Fuchs, uh, an American composer who, who's just written a, an aria for baritone and orchestra called Falling Man, based mm -hmm. on the Don DeLillo 9-11 right. novel. And he was so uh, uh, taken with the musical material that he was using for Falling Man that he decided to, in a, in a more sort of rigorous, you know, piano solo setting, decide to um, make these uh, uh, fugues, these canons. So there's a set of seven falling canons that, that he's written and I'll record probably in a year or so, but in the meantime, I'll play mm -hmm. them, you know, on, on from the top now and again. Do, do, is this something you think evolved from your experience as a child uh, with a rock band and, and interested in jazz music and then your time in, in school? Or it's just something that had a kind of an evolutionary effect? And I think I've, I've always been fascinated with uh, bringing, uh, I mean, I, I like playing beautiful music and I, you know, I, I simplify it by saying that I always play what I like, but I always think it's, it's, it's invigorating and, and good for all parties listening and performing to introduce folks to music that they may not have heard before. Um, and that, that can even happen within the standard repertoire. You know, I mean, Mendelssohn is, is hardly an obscure composer, but you know, when I was in school, I was playing the, the E major Mendelssohn sonata, which you know, nobody really knew, but I felt was a really great piece. You know, Alexander Scriabin is not a terribly well-known composer, but you know, bringing his music to the fore was, was something that I found uh, a nice thing to do. In, in some of my arrangements concerts now, I'm, I'm bringing in uh, lesser known contemporary classical composers into, into uh, what is basically a more or less improvised sort of programmatic form. And so people coming to hear Radiohead are hearing that, but they're also hearing, you know, preludes by Galina Ustvalskaya and pieces by Thomas Addis and, and what have you. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited by the prospect of, of 
bringing in a lot of unfamiliar music to audiences. Well, on that subject, it seems to connect in a way with From the Top, uh, the radio program, because there, there um, you have new voices and new instruments um, maybe playing uh, long uh, valued music, but um, kind of in a new way with um, a special format and also just available to all of us on a, on a weekly basis. And well, we have, I mean, we have a lot of kids on the show uh, play some of the more popular mm -hmm. instruments. I mean, there are a lot of pianists and violinists and flute players, and, and so you'll hear a lot of music that you've heard before, but when we have a trombone player, when we have a saxophonist, when we have a percussionist, mm -hmm. Um, you're almost invariably hearing new music, um, and if if we if we decided to announce, you know, here's from the top, and you're going to hear uh, contemporary classical composers, people would be, be running screaming, you know, and and not turn not tune in. But the fact that we're presenting these kids who are playing the four music, four minutes of music, five minutes of music that they feel most passionately about, this is the best introduction to unfamiliar music that I can imagine. You know, this is their moment to shine, and this is the music that they choose to make it shine. Uh, and and they speak eloquently about it. They 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 talk uh, about what led them to this piece, why they think it's great, uh, and so they're the best emissaries for for this kind of unfamiliar music. And because we're getting to know them as personalities, as performers, we're willing to listen to whatever they have to have to offer. So what's been, what have been some of your favorite surprises, things that you didn't anticipate, um, or, um, or things that shifted in a direction that you didn't expect? There, there, I think the percussion repertoire has been, um, has, has been the most invigorating. There's a piece, Paul Smadbeck, uh, Rhythm Dance. There's this fantastic uh, piece for marimba solo. And Joshua Jones has, has been on our radio show and he's been on our television show. Mm -hmm. And uh, rhythm, rhythm, is it rhythm song or rhythm dance? Rhythm. I'm not sure, <laughs> rhythm song. Um, it, it has a, a great sense of concentratedness and this enormous range of dynamics that Joshua brings out of this mallet instrument uh, in, in a way that rivals you know, anything that can come out of the piano. Those kinds of, of things are extraordinarily, you know, uh, surprising and 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 uh, humbling, really. Mm -hmm. And what what have you learned from the kids on the show? What have you learned from the young? Well, people? I learned a lot. I mean, basically, when I was in school myself, as a pianist, you were working a lot on your own, um, working on your Chopin etudes and things like that. But I've always uh, been interested in in chamber music, in terms of melding, again, you know, in this, this conceit of the piano being capable of all kinds of different colors, uh, trying to make a comfortable environment for another instrument. In other words, uh, one of my early chamber music coaches and, and mentors was Benjamin Zander, who was a, a wonderful conductor and started life as a cellist. And I would play um, for his lessons, you know, his, some of his cello students, and you know, I was I was made to feel that the piano was was really a, a, a hindrance more than a help to to a cellist sounding really good, uh, because of course the cello was a was a singing instrument. You know, you draw the bow, you draw the sound out, and it's it's probably the closest thing to the human voice that there is. And of course, the human voice is you know the ultimate singing instrument. And here you have the piano, which is a percussion instrument in essence. And, and so he said, you know, you have to work against the natural proclivity of the instrument in order to make a sound environment that, that makes it possible for a cellist to sing. Basically, if my student doesn't sound good, it's your fault. <laughs> so, so this was always something that was a challenge to me and something that I thought was a, a worthwhile pursuit. Um, and so working against the percussive aspects of the instrument and working towards a more singing kind of thing, you know, is, is always what we're working on on the piano. I mean, my, my teacher, Russell Sherman, was somebody who often said that Beethoven is always asking you for 20% more 
more sound, more speed than, than anyone is capable of. It's always about stretching the boundaries of the instrument that makes it really interesting. So in light of that, and in light of the fact that I spend a lot of my time working on my own, it's interesting and it's, it's invigorating and it's inspiring to dance with different partners all the time. You're, you're, you're dealing with completely different, not only sound worlds, but uh, I ideas and concepts of phrasing. Uh, of rhythm, of rubato, of, of you know the give and take mm -hmm. within a phrase, and the degree to which I, as a collaborative pianist, can put myself at the service of 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 my collaborative partner, uh, enriches me as as a musician. So yeah, virtually every time that we come to music rehearsal for for these for these shows, I'm I'm there as accompanist and slave mm -hmm. to all these kids. And I say from the, from the outset, <clears throat> play exactly the way you want to. And I will do my best to, you know, to, keep, to keep up and, and try and read you and figure out exactly what it is that you want to do. So it's, it's always about their intentions and their, their best wishes. That must be a transforming <clears throat> moment in their lives. It is, in mine. Yeah. it is in mine. It is in mine. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it is in theirs. You know, I, I, I can only imagine that. I mean, it, playing, playing music with somebody else is is a very tough thing to do. Most of these kids are, you know, playing uh, on their own, and and maybe if they're doing a competition, they've they've hired an accompanist for a couple of hours, um, and you know, some are extraordinarily conscientious, and others are serving time. You know, so. It really is the luck of the draw, and so having, I think it, it is helpful to them to have somebody with such a dysfunctional attitude as mine that, you know, if they don't sound good, it's totally my fault, <laughs> right. that, you know, that, that's got to be a help to them. And when you say it's transforming for you, what do you mean? By I'm, that? I'm picking up on a whole different uh, sensibility, music, musical, personal, mm -hmm. and that that changes me as a, as a musician as well on an, instant, an instantaneous basis. Well, these young people that you highlight um, for the rest of us to experience, um, are, do you see them as uh, creators? Are they creative people? And if so, what is, the, what is inspiring them to do this? Oftentimes, it's, it's, it's a way of expressing themselves uh, and it, it has the same kind of visceral excitement as expressing themselves on the tennis court or on, on the track team. It's an invigorating experience. It makes them bigger than themselves. And in, in the sort of the more communal aspects, I mean, kids in orchestras, kids in choruses, kids in string quartets, this is a, a palpable, energizing experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, we, we're coming to know that, you know, it's not just all hand-eye coordination. It really is uh, personal and, and spiritual uh, inspiration in that you know, it gives a young person in particular the feeling that if you dedicate yourselves to something, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. You can make something that can change the world. You can make something that moves people. I mean, that's, that's Arguably, you know, the same uh, can be said for a, you know a football team. You know that that it makes us larger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. The communal experience of, of being at a football game can be the same thing as as being at a, a, at a wonderful performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Whether you've heard the piece or or not before, the feeling of community and commonality uh, is palpable and uh, unspoken, but completely understandable. Are right, do you, uh, for each. Uh, radio program that you have, do you ha have a sense that the kids that are involved in that form a kind of temporary community? They feel connected to one another, maybe for a long time, even if they can't act on that. Or every it's it's interesting you mention it because every every show is like a graduating class. These kids are all folks that have come from uh, different parts of the country. They may ha come from, as I say communities of musicians, you know, orchestras, they may have this sense of, of, of community within the musical framework, or they may be somebody who, you know, got beat up for the fact that they play the classical saxophone, 
They may have no friends at all, and they, they may come you know, to a show and realize, yeah, here's, here's another set of kids who are the only ones on their block who are doing what I'm doing, and it gives them a, a real sense of empowerment. And so, yeah, they, they do keep in touch, and they do, you know, they, they do form friendships, and, and, uh, and, you know, I feel like sometimes, you know, they, they may need encouragement or, uh, you know, encouragement before a show, but, you know, I go back into the dressing room, and they're, you know, they're all cheering each other mm-hmm. on, and, and they have Yeah, I like things. the fact that it's not a competitive environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, once they're here, it's not competitive. It's very difficult to come into it. Right. Well, it's, I mean, the, the, the idea of getting on the show seems to have a sort of competitive, competitive aspect to it because you do have to send in an audition tape, but a lot of kids are sort of shied away from, from that and, and feel a little bit over-conscientious as if it's an all-or-nothing situation. We've, we've uh, I mean, I, I don't personally listen to all the audition tapes. I, you know, there's, there, there's a whole segment of our staff who does only that, but given that, it is not an all-or-nothing situation in the least. These are ongoing relationships. There, there, there may be an eight-year-old trumpet player who's just fantastically talented, but, I mean, at eight years old, that's not necessarily the best thing in the world for, for an eight-year-old <laughs> child. So, gosh, thanks for sending the tape, and please send us another one in a couple of years, and, and you know, then the time may be right. And, and, and so these are the kinds of relationships that are ongoing. And, and have to do with letting these kids present themselves in their own best light, in their own best time. And this is the 10th anniversary of the show. This mm-hmm. year is right. So you are bringing back people who were on the program. From all of our seasons, uh-huh. yeah. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> tomorrow night, Melissa White will be on our show. She appeared uh, when we did a show uh, uh, in honor of, of Representative Joe Moakley from Massachusetts uh, at the Library of Congress in mm-hmm. Washington, D.C., and she played some Saint-Saëns. She might have been, she might have been 14 or 15 at that point, and an extraordinary young violinist at the time. As a matter of fact, I, you know, for a brief time I was running my own little chamber music festival all over on Hilton Head, and when they asked me, you know, who, who my collaborators would ideally be, I said, well, I have all these kids that I play with. They, I think they'd be really good. Melissa came for mm-hmm. both summers of, of that program, and so we've actually played uh, professionally together. Right. Now she's uh, part of a, a, the Harlem String Quartet, who uh, are playing all over the country and, and doing great, great things. She's, in the meantime, been uh, to the Curtis Institute, you know, probably the most highly regarded music school mm-hmm. in the country. And uh, so she's she's doing great great things professionally. But we have we have kids who are also you know who who have never given up their music, but have gone on and uh, done other things and, and achieved in, in other great realms. I mean, we had a a young girl who was on the show, and it was sort of a a joke because we really couldn't figure out whether she should be on the show as a pianist or as a violinist. Um, and you know, when we asked her what she really like she said well actually I'm really into nanobiology <laughs> and that was the gag right. line but you know then she's now I'm she's sure a, you asked her some important questions about nanobiology well I didn't have to because we did we, we revisited her a few years later as she's now running um, a big uh, a well granted uh, Harvard program in stem cell technology so so she's gone on and, and uh, continued in music, but has gone on and done really great things. In Have music. you developed any brain theories as a result of all this work with music and young people? Um, uh, we were just having, my colleagues and I were just talking yesterday about the uh, large number of students who are uh, cross-disciplinary majors, mm-hmm. um, science, chemistry, and music in particular, yeah. or it might be theater and anthropology. Um, but especially in music and science and music. And yeah, chemistry. music and math, I think, uh-huh. is is the great correlative. Um, and I, but I do think uh, more than that, it's. It, I mean, they're, they're, those are those are the easy fits. But I think more than that, it's a, it's a matter, particularly with young children, of learning a discipline. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, of course, we we all talk about. Oh well, you know, why do I have to learn this now? because it's never going to do me any good. You know, what is trigonometry going to do for me later in life? The it's fact not. that you're learning a discipline is, is a way of training your mind. And 
training your mind in music, I mean, the, the nice payoff is that you make a beautiful sound at the end of, you know, working really hard. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, it's, it's a way of, you know, working out your brain in, in a particular way that will stand you in good stead. What are your thoughts about the impact of technology on all of this? For example, things like um, Guitar Hero and, um, you know, the, the computer simulations of musical instruments and our ability to manipulate those. I think um, technologically the, the, the biggest advances and the biggest, uh, the things to be really excited about have more to do with uh, the history of music. The fact that um, listening to other great performances mm -hmm. from, from decades ago used to be a matter of one of the dustiest corners of Tower Records you know, where all of the historical performances were relegated. You would have CD versions of old 78s or old cylinder recordings of, of you know, Stravinsky playing or Rachmaninoff playing. Um, but now you have, in addition to all, all of that stuff, uh, on YouTube, you know, you, you have, you know, television performances mm -hmm. and, and live performances of all these great, you know, uh, violinists and pianists and, and musicians, conductors from long time past. And you have kids who, you know, are not only conscious of the latest competition winner of, of, uh, of, of their particular instrument, but are interested and avidly pursuing and, and, and gobbling up all of the historical performances they can find. You know, if you want to hear how Bartok is played by Joseph Zygotty, his collaborator at the time of his life, you can mm -hmm. see it on YouTube. Uh, I think that's really exciting. And I think what's most exciting is, is that kids can, you know, avail themselves of, of, those, of those resources. And it's, you know, I mean, Guitar, guitar Hero is, is one thing, but, you know, there are also uh, YouTube clips of, you know, famous guitar players actually showing you how to play, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Smoke on the Water and all this right. stuff. It's, it's all, you know, absolutely hands-on, and, and there they are in front of you. Well, speaking <laughs> of technology, I understand um, you're a voracious reader. I am. So I would like to have a little book conversation with you um, and find out what you're reading. And also, do you have a Kindle? You know, I do most of my reading on the stair machine, uh -huh. and I'm schwitzing constantly. <laughs> I don't think this would do very well with a Kindle. <laughs> that said, you know, and some I, treatments for that. But, you know. I'm, I'm sure there's probably <laughs> not to get too gross about it, but but there is a you know I've, I've read all of Dickens, and and there is a certain pride seeing those swollen Penguin Classics editions mm -hmm. that have my, all my sweat through all the hundreds yeah. of pages. <laughs> that I don't think I would I would it have that very feeling. Sentimental, yeah. Yes, exactly. So I, I'm at present. I'm reading, well, I'm just now reading James Ellroy. I, I go back and forth between reading something fairly serious and reading, you know, crime novels. You know, James Ellroy, Ken Bruin, Jason Starr, Ross MacDonald, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of great writers. Um, but my, my biggest, uh, most important discovery of recent times is, has been the work of Roberto Bolaño. Um, and uh, he's... He, he died when he, you know, three or four years ago, I think, but uh, wrote extraordinary, uh, fantastical novels and incredible things. You know, I, I, I jumped in both feet first uh, and read his three-volume epic, 2,666. Wow. Um, uh, but also he's, he's written phenomenal novels called The Savage Detectives, The Skating Rink, Amulet, Nazi literature in the Americas, which is a very funny book. It's it's almost like a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an encyclopedia of, of you know rather tediously titled you know essays of you know it's all, all of these you know sort of fake biographies of, uh, but but it, so much of his his work his work has to do with just the passion for the spoken word or the written word mm -hmm. or the the fact that you know there are these you know these young destitute, you know, no, uh, poets in, in Mexico City who, you know, just revere all of this, you know, very unknown, it's, it's sort of the, just the, the passion of, of literature is, is really sort of at the essence of his work, I think. So you are a performer, you are, um, you've 
create musical arrangements. You uh, have this you know, fabulous radio and now television show as mm -hmm. well, program, and an avid reader and also exercise, right? Indeed. Yeah. So how do you, how do you nurture the creative spirit? I mean, that's a lot of stuff to do. With, with well, the, I'll tell you, the endorphins really help. Uh -huh. The endorphins are very important right. to the creative spirit. So that's the, the exercise part. I think so, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so it's the exercise. It's the, mm -hmm. And anything else? How do, how do you manage all of that? It's every day, you know, it's every day I have to, I have to, you know, practice. I mean, this is probably the longest I've been away from the piano for the last 24 hours, you know, sitting okay. here talking to you. Okay. It makes well, me very gonna, nervous. Well, it's right there. Okay, we're well, actually going to fix that. that. All right. <laughs> <coughs> you want to tell us what you're going to? Yeah. This is probably the, the piece that <coughs> made me most excited about the piano. Piece by Maurice Ravel, if I can remember it. Um, uh, but again, uh, inspired by literature. His sweet Gaspard de la Nuit, uh, Ghosts of the Night, inspired by Mallarmé poems. Um, this is the first of the three uh, called Ondine, which is uh, the name of a sort of a crazy water sprite who falls in love with a, an ocean-going man, lives by the sea, and she's trying to talk him into ruling the waves with her, and she'll introduce him to her father, Neptune, and they'll have a great time.
Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. There we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Af after that, I'm not sure that there is a whole lot more to say. I think mm -hmm. that we have. Or any questions? Yeah, I think we might have questions from the, from the group and members of the audience have a. How did the connection come about with from the top in your career? Well, I, uh, I went to music school at the New England Conservatory of Music, and um, the two executive producers of From the Top, Jennifer Hurley Wales and Gerald Slavitt, uh, had affiliations with New England Conservatory. Jerry has been on the board of overseers for a long time, and um, although not a musician himself, his daughter is a, is a professional, professionally trained oboist, and Jerry became really interested in uh, helping the preparatory division orchestra at New England Conservatory uh, do their touring. He was, he's actually been responsible for helping them tour worldwide. He's taken to Cuba a few times. And, and he became fascinated with this whole idea of this touring ensemble of these fantastically talented kids. Jennifer was also on the development staff at New England Conservatory. And, um, Jordan Hall, the main performing arts hall, was being given a facelift and getting its historical landmark status. And so the thought was, well, he, you know, here we got a, we got a place we can put on a show. You know, why not do a, like have a, a radio show based sort of in Jordan Hall? And why don't we have these, you know, these kids, you know, on, on the radio playing music and talking about making music? And so that was really sort of the, the idea of the show. Um, I was, at the time they were making up this idea, actually Jerry's, a, uh, Jerry's got probably the best radio voice you can imagine, but really doesn't know anything about music and was really a <laughs> miserable interviewer. Um, you know, you can only say, you know, well, when did you start playing the piano and, you know, where, you know, do, do you ever get tired of practicing? Anyway, he's got a great voice, but they decided they wanted to find somebody else to do the hosting. And so I was somebody who had gone to New England Conservatory and who, uh, at the time, Jerry and Jennifer had seen me do um, a program, a profile on me on CBS Sunday morning where I was playing at Carnegie Hall and doing a recital, but also in my New York basement apartment extolling the orchestral virtues of uh, Public Enemy and Skinny Puppy. And so they thought <laughs> maybe I might be somebody who could speak to, you know, the musical world uh, in an unstuffy manner, maybe. I also had been doing a fair amount of talking and playing during my performing career uh, as part of the affiliate artists program, you know, where I, I would play with a symphony orchestra, but I would also go play at the AT&T corporate headquarters, or I would play at uh, a Parents Without Partners, and, you know, or at hospice, or at a prison, or at a car dealership. And so it was about, you know, talking about why I play music, not just about the music, but, you know, w what it means to me personally. So that was something that I was doing a fair amount of. And um, so they called me, and I, as, as, a, as I remember it, I was also, you know, at the time playing a lot of concerts professionally and, and actually watching the audiences for classical music really die off. And there were moves afoot to try and reinvigorate interest in classical music, but I didn't really feel that there was anything sincere or worthwhile in that department. I mean, making a, an orchestral brochure look like a Harlequin romance was not really a way to bring classical music audiences, or, or maybe having a pops conductor arrive from flying in from the wings in a Superman costume doing, you know, John Williams scores was not going to make big audiences for the next Mahler third, you know, the third graders, you know, where's Superman, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, so I, I thought this idea sounded really neat. Um, and uh, from that point on, you know, I, I became the host and eventually had to be told to shut up because, again, as an interviewer, I'm also listening to these kids tell their stories and it reminds me of something in my life and so I was seeking to embellish their story by having the resonance of my own career. And my mother, who uh, was a manager of a radio station, said, you know, you are the last person we want to hear from. We want to just hear these kids. So I got, I finally figured out 
or I'm still figuring out, you know, how to how to to, to do the interviewing thing. Um, but it's been uh, we've, we've been on the air ten years, and and uh, every every year and every show is a contributive and ongoing creative sort of process in terms of how how we do the show, what we're trying to accomplish, and and uh, the kids really are the are the ones who teach us how to do that. Do you do more traveling uh, or do more in Jordan Hall? Oh, we do most of our shows on the road now. Yeah, well, when we're listening, it all. Yeah, we do, we, we do maybe three or four shows a year in Jordan Hall, but every place else that we do, uh, do a show, we, are, we go where we're invited. And uh, it was funny, the first, I think the first show we did in Georgia, because, you know, Peach Tree Public Radio, which is what it was called back then, was one of our first, you know, blocks of stations. And uh, we played down in Spivey Hall, and there were folks who had heard every show and could tell you, you know, which kid, how old they were and what they played, and, you know, it was just... An extraordinary thing, and uh, but that's the kind of experience that we have everywhere we go because you know these are people who get to know you as friends on the radio, and then coming to see you, you know, live doing these shows. It's it's really an extraordinary experience. Yeah. Yeah. When you find that your creativity is being challenged or, or going through a phase of where it's dwindling, mm -hmm. do you use something familiar to reinvigorate it, or do you? try something completely new and go to something from unfamiliar territory or do you have like a staple that you go to it's interesting for, I mean for, for me I'm, I'm very lucky because if I'm not particularly excited about some classical concerto that I'm getting you know reinvigorating for a, for a concert performance if I'm feeling a little bit stale on it I've got a, an arrangement that I'm doing or if, if, if that's not happening then I've got loads of music to learn for the show so there's really no no downtime. There's no there's no time for me to really be able to to have a sort of a block. But I, I think part of that is is as a result of having many different facets of creativity going. So if I'm not doing an arrangement, I'm I'm revisiting older repertoire, or even if I'm just doing classical repertoire, just it helps to be working not only rock on Rachmaninoff but working on Mozart, so that those two styles tend to invigorate each other in terms of uh, different things that they ask ask of me. Um, so I'm 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 blessedly you know uh, a block creatively is not available to me. <laughs> I'm happy to say, but I, I think you know part of it is also the idea that you know yeah I think interaction with musicians is what keeps things fresh because as I say, working as a solo pianist. You know, if you only have your own sensibility and your own sets of reactions, it's very, very hard to shake yourself up, uh, even though, you know, you may have a, a pretty good work ethic or you may have an idea of, you know, looking freshly at a score whenever you, re, you know, revisit it. Uh, it still is, is probably the most important aspect of my career to be able to interact with other musicians on a regular basis. more of an opinion-based question. Um, uh, if music notes were to literally fall from the sky, what do you think would grow? <laughs> For me, I think it would be color. I mean, I, I, I have a much more sort of <coughs> synesthetic sort of um, idea of, of notes. And so, um, and from a sensual standpoint, I, I think of things coloristically. I think there are, there are some that would actually, as real synesthetes, people who have actual conflations between senses, there would be, you know, notes falling from the sky would make them smell something particular, or, or would make them see a particular visual pattern, or, or would remind them of a, of a particular meal. So I think it has to do, you know, for me it's color. For me it's, it's definitely a visual thing. What about for you? What would you see? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I think about people springing up. Someone has to hear them. So. That is funny because uh, you know, actually, my and this doesn't happen in any other with any other piano but my own. I have a a piano that uh, lived in the 92nd Street Y concert hall, and was Alicia Delaroche's favorite piano. But 
only when I play on that piano do I, you know, it's not like I'm fantasizing about somebody. It's like all of a sudden I see a face and it's nobody that I know. It's always a girl, but I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's nobody that I know and it's just like all of a sudden it takes shape in front of me. And that, you know, that doesn't happen on any other instrument. I mean, it doesn't happen on any other piano that I can, that I can name. And it's, and it's not the wine, okay? Um, it's, uh, it really is, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing. Maybe it's all those sixth grade girls who didn't... That's what, I'm taking my revenge out. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it true that you do impressions or of others? No. Okay. Only, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I occasionally, occasionally will trot out Cartman from South Park for sound check. <laughs> <laughs> Only for sound check. Okay, all right. So. But, that's, but that's, that's one that I can actually teach because... Cartman only only does one vowel. There's only one vowel that you need for Cartman. So when he sings, it's all one vowel. It's great. Do you live in New York? No, no, no. New York is much too much of a full-time job. Uh, I lived there for a dozen years. I now live in Sagamore Hills, Ohio. Do you like Grater's ice cream? Who? Grater's ice cream. Grater's? Yeah, it's, it's in Cleveland. It's like the best ice cream ever. I don't know Grater's. There, there, there are several like uh, custard shops. There's Haydn's, which is also near, near my house, and there's another one yeah, nearby. Grater's. I don't know Grater's. <laughs> are, they, are they Cleveland or are they Cincinnati then? Cincinnati really is, is like a hotbed of great food, you know, between that and Skyline Chili, you know. Although Pittsburgh, where I grew up for high school, is probably the center of great junk food. You can't get a better sub, I, I maintain. Forget about Philadelphia. Buffalo. Well, in Buffalo, of course, we have the chicken wings from Buffalo, from Anchor, the Anchor Bar. Well, no, not, what's the best place? Duff. Duff's. Where, where'd you grow up in Pittsburgh? Uh, Squirrel Hill. Oh, I'm from Pittsburgh. It's very funny because my, my uh, piano teacher, Harry Franklin, was, was making a phone call. Squirrel Hill is, because I, I grew up in Evanston, which is right next to Skokie, probably the, the, you know, the, it's the biggest Jewish ghetto in the country. And Squirrel Hill is, this, is the same. Mm -hmm. And so Harry's on a phone call with Daniel Berenboim's father in Tel Aviv. And they say, well, you know, Mr. Berenboim is not at home. Leave me your number, and I'll, I'll ring you back when the line is not engaged. So 412, the area code 521. Oh, you're in Squirrel Hill. <laughs> I love that. Squirrel Hill, you know, the best, best bagels, best locks, I best everything. Oh, God. But, but the best subs, too. Seriously. Ice cream, though. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we can buy them. Not so much with ice cream. No, yeah. not about the ice cream. Well, when uh, we saw you come in earlier, um, we noted that this was your third trip out to Emory and to the Schwartz Center, and uh, I think you said it feels like home, and so we're glad for you to consider us as your home and look forward to you um, both this week and also return visits. And very honored. Thanks very much. Thank you, very, so, uh, th thank you so much, Rosemary. Yeah, it was a real you. pleasure. Yeah, pleasure having thanks. you here. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.